I got together with Captain Crankshaft to give him the history of some of the smallest cars ever built. To see how he experienced them on the road, head over to Captain Crankshaft here on YouTube. Folded down to make beds. Uh-oh. <laughs> yes, and this is a massive failure. Uh, you know, they had a little chain on the side though to keep you from falling out. I've also never been in something that gets so many smiles as you drive past. It's just such a fun car. Like, it, it jolly fits it so perfectly. If you want the greatest in automotive adventure, subscribe to Captain Crankshaft. And while you're at it, subscribe to the Audre. Jackson, I know that you are all about legendary cars and extraordinary driving experiences. Did you have any today? Uh, yes. <laughs> it may be a stretch. It may be a stretch. But this thing is certainly one of the more interesting cars that I drove today. It's just so quirky and weird, and I honestly don't know that's why you're here to explain to me why it exists in the first place, but it's pretty unusual. Well, there's a thoroughly practical reason that this car exists okay. and cars like it. Um, after World War II, Europe was in a pretty bad way. And realizing that sort of the transition from the bicycle and motorcycle culture to an automobile culture, which happened with the Model T in America, um, hadn't really taken hold in Europe yet. You realize okay. that the Volkswagen didn't come out until after World War II. Um, the Topolino Fiat in Italy came out during the 1930s and was very successful, but still hadn't reached the level of, of sort of societal saturation that the Model T, Model A, things like that reached in the US. So after the war, not only were people uh, very, very, very uh, basically desperate to find transportation, but they also didn't have a lot of money. Okay, and so the sense. answer was these motorcycle-based cars, they basically enclosed motorcycles. <laughs> yeah. um, and they had the advantage of being easy to build for the manufacturers still rebuilding their factories, which have been bombed out and also easy to afford for people to buy them because they are very low taxes and the licensing requirements were also very low. Gotcha. Now, what's interesting from a US point of view, <laughs> and especially here in 2024, is the fact that this is a family car. This is a family car? It's a family car. Look at that back seat. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> you saw advertisements for cars like this Messerschmitt all the time with a cheery mom or cheery dad driving their kids to school in the morning. Oh, perfect. They served a great purpose, and again, they were specific to the roads for which they were built. Okay, so using not one fast, of these, yeah, I using, imagine. <laughs> well, using one of these in the US, even as a city car, is a big stretch. But nonetheless, for the cities and, and, and towns of Europe, this makes perfect sense. It's a thing you could park anywhere. The road, the quality of roads was not terrific. So, you know, riding in this wasn't a big hassle. You didn't have to worry about speeding down a, a highway in one of these. You notice this looks very much like an airplane. Yeah, it's got this whole kind of cockpit vibe to it. It's with built the... by someone who was building aeroplanes not long sense. before they built this. Gotcha. So therefore, it was also very easy to, again, take their tooling and their uh, technical expertise and to produce a vehicle like this. Was it successful? Did it sell well? It's very successful in oh, Germany, okay. absolutely. As an export model, no, not, not so, so much. much. <laughs> not so much. From the practical, the ultra practical, something not quite so practical, but a hell of a lot of fun, let's go to the Jolly. Sounds good. It's not the uh, epitome of safety when I was driving it because there is a, a tendency to feel like you're sliding out in a corner. But <laughs> well, you're a little too young to remember the truly great arcade rides of amusement parks in the 1960s and 70s. They were more or less like this. Uh, you know, they had a little chain on the side though to keep you from falling out uh, if you went too fast around a, a track. But nonetheless, this is to me one of the best micro cars or small cars ever made because it takes a totally practical city car, the Fiat 600, the Seicento, and turns it into a complete useless toy. <laughs> I love that. And it doubles is. the price while well, it does it. <laughs> does it? Doubles the price. These are custom built by the Ghia Coachworks, same people that built Ferraris and Maseratis and Alfa Romeos. They took these Fiats, very practical Fiats, and just 
sawed the tops off, reinforced them, because they are. They know what they're doing. But you know, when you drove this, did it seem like it was looser or, or twisty? No, it actually felt great, I'll be honest. It was See? surprising how well it drove. Which is one of those things that all those people hold my beer while I cut the top off my car and make it a convertible, <laughs> yeah. don't get. That's fair, <laughs> that's fair. But the, the top is there for a reason, to sort of hold everything together. I've also never been in something that gets so many smiles as you drive past, it's just such a fun car. Like, it, it jolly fits it so perfectly. And you see, that's one of the things, too, that uh, is very useful for you as you pursue your project. Because, you know, it's really wonderful for you to, on a bargain uh, basis, take this supercar, but you realize that there are certain attitudes that you get when you drive a supercar down the road, and you get waves, but usually with not all the fingers on the hand. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they don't know that you've rebuilt it. <laughs> that's they just think, true. oh, this is this smart kid. Like, oh, yeah. When did daddy give him that? Exactly. You know? So, uh, so you know, <laughs> utility vehicles are always fun because people are always giving you a thumbs up. You just think, wow, that is so neat. And wow, that person is so brave for driving that. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a car that was for the everyman, the everyman's family car, that became the toy of the ultra wealthy. Mm. The very same vehicle, one just made slightly insane, and the, uh, the other is still incredibly practical. Plus, um, they do make um, replicas of these. So if you're going to buy one as your ultimate investment tool, you have to make sure you actually buy a real one because oh, people gosh. are still all over the world, and especially in Italy, cutting the tops off of Fiat 500 and 600 and making jollies. Well, they got the right idea. It's definitely so, more uh, fun. Let's look at one of my other favorites uh, over here. Sounds good, lead the way. Now the Mini is one of the absolute marvels of engineering progress. Alec Isagonis, who designed this car, wanted to, again, post-war Britain. They had a real need for a small car. The Austin 7 before World War II was the Model T of England. And so they needed a new version of this. They came out with the Morris Minor after the war. And that needed to be updated after a while because it's still a very sort of 40s-ish car. And when you realize what Isagonis achieved with this car, the transverse front-mounted engine, front-wheel drive. You had so much space inside the car. It was a car that could fit four actual adults. <laughs> which is shocking. Which is yeah. absolutely amazing in a space this big. Um, now, of course, the Mini gets a lot of credit for this packaging, the, the way the engine is, is in the car and all that. Dante Giacosa did it with the Fiat Topolino before the war, but that's just because I'm an Italian <laughs> nut. So. But nonetheless, these are amazing uh, vehicles. And again, the practicality, all the different versions. They made sedans, uh, station wagons, and this incredibly practical pickup truck. I know, the platform is really, apparently, the driving it wise, this thing drives, uh, compared to all of these, the most modern. It feels really like a more modern car, comparatively, and it's just cool that they can turn it into something so practical. <laughs> so obviously, like everything is scale, uh, metric, and, and, and uh, imperial, and, uh, there were obviously smaller sheets of plywood in the UK than were available in the United States so that you know you couldn't like you know angle it over the roof or anything like that. This is a very late example and one of the things that I find funny about the late examples of these is the fact that all of that work that Alec Isagonis did to make as much space as possible inside they took away by putting making the seats fatter and fatter and <laughs> and putting more things on the dashboard so all of a sudden it was far more cramped than the early ones ever were, which is it's fairly hysterical. Like it that. feels just like a go-kart. Yeah. It's like hilarious. It has honestly a lot of power for something so small, or it's just using the power very effectively because it weighs so little. But the steering is so direct. It's, it's really fun. It's, you feel how small it truly is in the corners, and it's a blast. And you're right, the interior feels really pretty spacious for how small it actually is. I didn't think about the fact that the newer ones have all the you know, modern tech and it takes up a lot of space. This has nothing. Nothing, so absolutely. And, and you know, you talked about the way it handles. These were incredible race cars as well. And it's really wonderful to look at the photographs of people racing these in the period when they were really on them and you see them all cornering on three wheels. <laughs> it, it, it's absolutely astonishing. Um, you drive one of these on the racetrack and you really get the true feel for what power to weight ratio gives you. It's not all about having the most horsepower. It's not all about having necessarily the lightest car, but when you get that 
perfect combination of lightness and power. It is absolutely amazing. What That's what I've thing. learned as I've got older. When I was younger, I thought the more horsepower, the better. And as I've aged, there is just the right amount of power, and this thing has it. It doesn't need any more power. It's, exactly. It's Once you get to my age, when you think you'll, you'll find out that 40 horsepower <laughs> and 700 uh, kilograms can give you a lot of excitement. Just ask Antonio about the Milla Milla. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so this is another really, really, really neat car because it's a great example of what used to be called a hybrid okay. uh, before that whole electric and gas thing came in. Uh, the National Metropolitan was designed in the USA, built in the UK for the Nash Corporation in the US. And the idea was, again, the Nash Corporation was, was ahead of its time because it really concentrated on building small cars because it was convinced that America needed more small cars, better economical driving, um, more fun, uh, and it almost made it happen because there was a big recession around 1956-57 and a lot of big cars, it's one of the reasons why the Edsel failed in 58, um, but they thought, you know, the answer was smaller cars, that's what people need. And so as we saw a few decades later when everyone turned to really small cars during the gas crisis and then as soon as gas dropped again, everyone got back in their big station wagons and then later into their big pickup trucks, <laughs> so they really didn't care. The, the collective automotive memory here in the U.S. tends to be fairly short. The really neat thing, you look at this door panel mm -hmm. and the way it's designed, you can basically use the same panel from the left or the right, punch a different hole for the, uh, for the door handle and for the trim. Gotcha. Fantastic. Saves a lot of money that way. That's smart. But it's really very much a typical English car of the mid-1950s. A lot of flash and very little go. I definitely noticed that while driving. I've never driven uh, like three gears on, on the, you know, the three on the tree before. That's new to me, but once I got the hang of it, it certainly wasn't fast, but it was shockingly easy to drive. Like, it, it's very smooth. It doesn't get up and go very quickly, but it's it's pretty decent. I'm shocked that like, what happened to Nash? Where did they go Like, if they're making such a great car? Well, the Nashes that made Nash were not these little Nash Metropolitans. They made some really terrific larger sedans. In fact, one of the great features of the Nash sedans of the 1950s, <laughs> which made them very popular with families and with dating couples, is that the seats folded down to make beds. Uh-oh. <laughs> yes, so... Um, they knew know, who they, they were going after. Uh, Nash was the first company to partner with Pininfarina in Italy really? to design all their sedans to give them Italian style and dash. And they advertised in their in their brochures that you could, you didn't have to buy a fancy sports car to get genuine Italian design. You could buy a Nash sedan. Um, and of course, Nash is one of those companies that became a part of what became American Motors. Mm -hmm. And American Motors is one of those great companies, one of the four companies that Jeep has saved from oblivion. So far, Jeep has now saved four companies and. I'm sure we'll continue doing that into the next millennium. Um, one of the other things which is uh, so great about these cars too is the fact that they are so much of their period. You know, you see the colors, you see the patterns. It's like, you know, this screams 1950s more than, you know, a diner with a poodle skirt and that whole thing, you know? It really it, does. It, it, it <laughs> is amazing. Cars as time machines. It is uh, absolutely astonishing. Uh, now, next to last, We'll talk about a really terrific example of British engineering and talking about a sporting experience. This was one of my favorites to drive, <sighs> by far. It's just, it's, when you talk about a sports car, I feel like what makes a great sports car is it has to be mechanical, it has to be raw and very like connected. And you couldn't be more connected to a vehicle than driving this. You're pretty much just part of the car. So. You are part of the car, you were on the road, literally, yes. <laughs> you reach your hand out, out the door and, and, and grab the, the road as it goes by. There's no suspension travel, as you found. Yep. <laughs> and talk about, you know, being like a go-kart. You think about where you want to go and the car's there. Exactly. It, is, it is so much fun and it's a car that just puts a grin on your face. You cannot you cannot frown as you're driving this car. It has a grin itself. It looks exactly. like it has a little grin. <laughs> it's also, it's all, what I love about this car too, it's one of the few examples of the horrible corporate bean counters giving the car the essential character that it has. The car is designed to have hidden headlights that would pop up. 
but they said that'll be it's gonna be too expensive we're not gonna do that just bolt the headlights onto the uh onto the hood <laughs> and that gave the car the entire character that it has i kind of love it yeah it, it's absolutely fantastic and it's practical it's got some space for luggage back there just enough <laughs> and it, it's, it's one of those things you know I, I say this all the time to the boredom of most but i don't care <laughs> um if i'm going to drive a car i'm going to want to do stuff with it i don't like cars that you want to spend 20 minutes in driving around then you want to park it because you can't do anything else i want to be able to go out for a weekend in a car and so a car has to have some practicality now the weekend you take in a sprite it's going to be a weekend in which it's going to be bright and sunny and warm like it is today. Yeah, it's lovely. It's a perfect day for it. <laughs> Absolutely great day. Um, and of course, like any, um, this is actually a perfect day for a British sports car. Because it's, the we're Brits simulating. bless their hearts, you know, <laughs> unless there's hail falling directly on you, you drive without a top. Yeah. What do you need a top for? That's, that's, that's why God made clothing. <laughs> um, and it, it's also one of these things, again, like the Mini, these were very successfully raced and continually raced today in vintage racing. They're incredibly tunable. So, you know, what starts out sort of 948 cc ends up maybe 1275, maybe almost 1400. I mean, you can do an amazing amount of tuning with these cars. So, you know, this is, I think, the entire story of tiny, utility, fun, Oh wait, there are two cars we didn't talk about. I just realized <laughs> um, these are probably the uh, the strangest designed ones. <laughs> well, you know, I, probably the, the, the most important thing um, is you know I think we need to see the license plate of this one. <laughs> oh yeah, um, just, just turn it because, around because uh, I think it's, it's most important actually to to see the best view of this car <laughs> um, and. Uh, well, you yeah. don't have to worry, uh, I feel like. The best part about this is, let's say, I mean, I don't know if you'd want to drive it in New York, but New York can be hard to find a parking spot. This you could just bring into your office building. You wouldn't have to worry about it too much. It's terrifying to drive, and it's not, it's not uh, getting out of its own way anytime soon, but. Jackson, the best thing about parking this vehicle is that you can park it and walk away. When you're done. Walk away. You no know, more pain it, and suffering. <sighs> You know, we talked about the need that the Messerschmitt served after the war. Britain actually recovered very, very slowly after World War II. And even by the late 50s, there was still a need for really inexpensive cycle-based cars because taxes were horrifying. Mm -hmm. And however, there is a limit to how utilitarian you really want to go. This might have been a little too far in one and direction. And how much you want to save. <laughs> um, the fact that this was and is road legal is so incredibly frightening to me <laughs> um, because I would much rather be on a, an open scooter than in this. Was there any crash regulations or is this acting as more of a scooter? You don't have to worry about because this would not survive any sort of crash. <laughs> this is not it's subject not to any safety regulations whatsoever. Perfect. <laughs> it's an enclosed motorcycle. Uh, okay, so it's counted as just motorcycle. There is a need for a vehicle like this. And I think that if I'm going to drive something like this, I want to have more visibility. So, of course, our friends at Peel came up with the Trident. Now, the Trident, of course, is infinitely more practical than the, uh, than the uh, P50 because, of course, you can actually see out of it. <laughs> Just what they needed. Now, you can't breathe in it. Mm -hmm. Um, and you overheat in it, even on a day like today where the sun, actually, yeah. when it does come out, beams right onto your head. <laughs> this, is, this is one of the most extraordinary vehicles ever conceived. And just as we talked about the Messerschmitt being a family car, the fact that this is actually a two-seater is... The feel is uh, pretty optimistic. Uh, it's... And this is a massive failure. They sold okay. none of these. <laughs> Absolutely none of these. Um, Were they but, surprised? <laughs> it's, it's hard to say. Um, the fact that they weren't immediately sued by Maserati that used the Trident um, as their symbol um, was, was enough. But the only good thing about the Trident Peel, Peel Trident, is that just as you saw in the Jetsons, all those flying bubble cars, 
This is close to a flying bubble car as you can get. It's you very know? futuristic looking. Extremely futuristic. The single spoke steering wheel, just it's, the it's, whole bubble. It's yeah, think about that. You've got the Jetsons driving a Citroen. Not quite, but, <laughs> um, but and, and, and what was cute on the bug eye sprite just looks sort of silly here. It, it doesn't it, scale it, very it, well, it, even you know, brought down in size a little bit. It does have a shocking amount of storage space. So you could maybe call it practical, yeah. but that could be a huge stretch. So I, what? I think that, that, that's where you want to sort of hide when someone finds out that you actually own one. <laughs> so what happened to Peel? Peel made this, didn't sell. Was it done after that? Or? Um, they didn't. Yeah, basically that was it. It was, that yeah. Was it. This, mean, you make... um, the, the, the P50 had a certain success. Uh, the Trident had no success whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And uh, they went back to uh, making baby carriages. Probably a better, a better place for them to be. <laughs> yeah, um, to fit six, seven, eight babies in one of these. And the, you could probably, you know, use the P50 as a baby carriage. Exactly. Yeah. Why not? So, um, you know, this, the great thing is that you know you've you've seen what can be accomplished in a small scale setting, and uh, who knows, we might uh, come back to one of these uh, one day and. Uh, We'll see. <laughs> Maybe new technology will really improve the way these drive. I mean, it's potential where electric motors with something like this maybe works. I don't know. I want to sit in, in one of these on top of a battery. Yeah, that, that would definitely uh, make me happy. Seems but safe. I'm glad at least that you appreciated the, the great, clever engineering and the incredible fun to be had in these other small vehicles and so uh, <laughs> Anything hopefully about the that it ke keeps your eyes open and uh, look for the, for the new wherever it comes. Well thanks for showing me around, that was really fun. My pleasure. I appreciate Jackson. it. Take care. Take care.